Who's ready for fantasy football season, huh? Oh, man, I'm ready to just get virtual with it. I'll beat you, though. I'll beat you. Yeah, you're scared. Whatever. Oh, what's going on, girls? What's going on? Pretty nice mansion, huh? You, you want to see the rest of it? I don't care. I hired you to be here. I bought friends. Welcome back, everybody. Um, for those of you that haven't been to a GabCon event in the past, this for us is somewhat of a dress rehearsal for what will likely be our biggest event of the year, which is at the NAB show in Las Vegas uh, coming up in April. The industry and NAB has had a bit of a challenge historically in getting brand and agency attention. It's been more of a broadcaster show, but with our help, NAB is putting on a two-day event at Encore on April 24th and 25th, dedicated almost entirely to the advertising community. It really is the, the premier event. And so day one is an ad innovation lab where we'll bring together 40 to 50 companies from the actual show floor um, and bring them over to the Encore and focus on really uh, five key areas. Over the top, AI and data, programmatic and addressable media, AR and VR, um, and a fifth that honestly escapes me at the moment. <laughs> um, but it's, it's an opportunity to really cover those five areas, um, do workshops on those categories, and, and so dig a little deeper. So as an example, AR and VR, we're not just going to talk about innovations and products that they bring to bear, but we'll have a director, as an example, from Pixar, uh, talk about how they're actually today implementing AR and VR and bringing the technology to life um, in, in their studios. So the idea, you know, coming from the client side and having gone to CES for many years is, you know, you want to go to a show like this and learn, um, but most importantly, you want to bring actionable insights immediately back to the office that you can apply um, to really pay for your time investment in the event. And that's really what day one will focus on. Day two is really in two parts. One is an event like this, the afternoon, we'll have breakout sessions on uh, an audio track, so what's going on in radio and audio in the programmatic and audience-based buying space. The other half is video and television. But the morning part of the session is really a cross between TED and Zeitgeist. So if you've been to either of those events, um, you know that those speakers are typically much more visionary, thinking about next generation marketing and advertising, what's coming, what's exciting, Think about, um, you know, in an age of robotics and, and space travel, what is marketing and advertising going to look like on, the, on Mars or on the moon, as an example? We, we will really be pushing the envelope with regards to the caliber of speakers, um, not to say that we don't have an amazing cast of speakers at the rest of our events, but really, really pushing it. And uh, we hope that you guys will participate and, and uh, take advantage of the opportunity of what we're building with NAB. We really believe that this will be the the beginning of something great. And like CES gathered brands and agencies and, and it's become sort of a must attend event. 90% of dollars are spent on radio, or, or I'm sorry, audio and video. This is a show if you're an agency or a brand or are selling in this space that you need to be attending um, and paying attention to. We, we came off of or came out of CES with, with a few key trends. Thank you, that would be helpful. AI bots and ver augmented reality were, you know, for anyone that's attended CES this year, you'd know that those were really the key trends that were really prominent uh, at the show. Um, and I'll say that for those who are here in the room today, if you don't know what Watson is, or Echo, or Alexa, or Cortana, um, or Google Home, um, I think hopefully everyone knows who Siri is. Um, you, you really need to leave this room and, and, and go, no, honestly, and go study after the end of today's event because these are things that are going to change the face of marketing. I want to give each of the speakers an opportunity to introduce themselves, but I think it was important to make that, you know, punctuate that point, which is these are, these are technologies that are changing the face of marketing today, and if you don't know what they are, um, it's in imperative that you, you spend some time to learn about them. So with that, Rhonda, you want to introduce yourself and your role? I'm Rhonda Bitterman, and I run global agency partnerships for The Weather Company, which is now an IBM business, and a mouthful. 
So when I go out on calls now, I'm talking a lot less about how we're going to work with advertisers and advertising agencies to use weather to deploy media campaigns and a lot more about how to bring IBM Watson Cognitive Solutions to bear on their entire consumer journey. How are we going to use this to do better audience planning, better creative, better measurement, better dashboards? Uh, it's all quite evolutionary and very exciting. And if you don't know about Watson, feel free to ask me afterwards. <laughs> Hello, I'm Doug Rosen, Chief Digital and Innovation Officer at OMD, uh, the world's most creative media agency, as ever. I like to say, ever. Uh, period. Um, but uh, these type of conversations are always a good break from uh, the other part of my day, which is dealing with addressability programmatic and, and our forever chase for the holy uh, way to target down to the individual. Um, I think this just brings a whole different perspective to that. You know, for the last 20 years, we've been talking about interactive marketing as the way we we can now converse with consumers um, and and with what things like Microsoft and Amazon and Apple and others are doing, IBM, we're, we're able to now move into more immersive marketing where it's not so back and forth, it's more um, conversational as we all like to talk to one, one another. So um, that's exciting. Um, I am Gary Heyman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nextref Technologies. And we're really focused on experiential marketing. Um, there's a lot of content out there, um, and there's a lot of people trying to grab for that sense of attention. And so to do that, you've really got to be able to provide it to a consumer just in time when they need it, uh, make sure it's easily accessible, make sure it's customized and personalized to them, and then I think really authentic um, to something that will relate to them. And so we've been doing a lot of work around engaging fans with brands in just ve very unique and compelling ways to leave that lasting impression that really gives those brands an opportunity to create that emotional experience with their consumers. Uh, Jeffrey Cologne, communications designer at Microsoft. Uh, I work on Bing ads, so the advertising side of, of Microsoft. And my role is sort of a hybrid. I try to figure out what ad products we can create by using ad products that competitors also uh, uh, have created. So how are the worlds sort of converging so that we can create more interesting, uh, more interactive uh, products? Uh, also, a published author wrote a book last year called Disruptive Marketing. I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't really help the audience understand what we mean when we talk about AI and, and bots and AR. And what I mean by that is, you know, when, when we talk about AI, there's cognitive learning, there's neuro, there, there's, there's several different opportunities within AI. Bots have historically had a negative connotation, so I think it's important to understand the new opportunity for bots, and it's not just ad fraud. When we talk about bots, there are some real positive uses, conversation bots and other types of bots in marketing. So it, why don't we start with, with AI, and, and maybe Rhonda and Jeff, y you guys can help us understand the differences between the different types of AI to frame the rest of the conversation. Sure. So with Watson, um, we really look at it not, we don't like to say AI, because the it's real cognitive. term is artificial intelligence, right. and we feel like that's scary. Sure. And it freaks people out, and it sounds like robots are going to take over the world. So we say they augmented are. intelligence. They're going to take over the world. They are. To a certain extent, they're going to make the world a little better. Um, Did you see iRobot? <laughs> Um, we are really looking at it right now and how to bring it forward for advertising and for marketing. And so we think a lot about how can we bring that you know, bot-like experience into a container that is familiar to advertisers and to consumers and have it live in an open environment so it doesn't have to stay secluded only on our O&Os or within our platforms but instead be in fact a portable piece of content you know, in a really trusted environment. That piece of content that lives inside of, right now, a 300 by 250 ad unit is familiar, and um, the interactions that we're offering are also somewhat familiar to consumers because we need to kind of train them gently 
on how to behave with these ads and come to expect a different kind of a relationship out of the engagement that happens together. So uh, the Watson technology allows a user using natural language, the way they speak, it, it can intuit questions even if they're not presented in a way that is correct with syntax, to deliver an answer that is 100% correct. I guess I shouldn't say 100%, but like very, very close to being sure. accurate. And with that, you start to develop a deeper one-to-one -one relationship with the brand, and from there, trust grows, and if trust grows, brand intent grows, if brand intent grows, you know, behavior happens. Purchases are made or consideration concludes. Okay. So we're really focused on, on that aspect of it right now. Okay, and when you guys talk about it in the context of Watson, it's cognitive learning. Is yes, that? it is. Okay. Yeah, so cognitive is what we say instead of AI. Okay. Jeff, do you want to yeah, add to I that? Mean, I, I always like to backtrack and just sort of define what artificial intelligence is because we have a tendency of putting it all in one bucket. Yeah. And there's actually three types of artificial intelligence. There is strong AI, which uh, John Searle started to develop in 1980 at the University of California at Berkeley. This is when you are actually trying to build a machine that can think. And that is very difficult to do. Uh, and many computer scientists don't think it may actually be possible. Or if we do that, it may only have the intelligence of an ant. Then you have applied AI. And we have seen this in a variety of different uh, uh, areas. We see this daily uh, on the stock exchange. They use applied AI. We also see this in uh, hospitals, where there is uh, software that can tell uh, a doctor what to do based on certain formulations. We also see this in a Word document now when you're writing, uh, it corrects all your spelling mistakes for you rather than having to use spell check. So applied AI is another area. And that doesn't, you know, that is really more of a, uh, a, of a help for what we do in our day to day. Then we have cognitive simulation, and this is with uh, facial recognition, other types of uh, technology, and this is what uh, neuroscientists and uh, behavioral psychologists, I think, will ultimately use. But I also think that's something that advertisers will use. I mean, one of the reasons why facial recognition is so big, uh, some of the other platforms, is because they are trying to figure out how that might be used for advertising down the line. So I think if we understand what those three, those three areas are, that's always good. Also noting that, like any technology, that's not uh, limited to just those three areas. We know that in a couple of years we could have different forms of artificial intelligence. So I always like to explain that to people because we have a tendency uh, to bucket things into one bucket. And I think what, what we're probably talking about here is applied artificial intelligence. Yeah. And, and so, Doug, in, in your world, you said the other half of your role is programmatic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a good part of today we've been talking about ad fraud and viewability. And you know, bots have had a role there, which has been a pretty negative role. What we're going to talk about in this session is a different sort of bot. Bots and for good. Exactly. So maybe you can help us understand. Well, I, to the, I, I think bots can be anything. I mean, they, they're chat bots. There's conversation bots. There's personal assistants. There's everything leading. And if you were at CES, I think we saw plenty of robots there, too. Yep. I think what bots in general are are the expression of artificial intelligence. Um, and if anything, it's putting the art into artificial intelligence. It's giving them a form factor in some way, whether it's an app that you can have a conversation through, an assistant that you might walk around, or just Siri, because I always have it with me. These are all ways that we look to use AI from an expressive standpoint. So I think there's a variety of form factors. I think wrote marketers are trying to figure out across all of these which are the right ones and what we also try to focus on is mixing you know putting the the utility and the experience together there are a lot of ways that you can use bots that are very utilitarian and we all use them when we call a utility to check on our service to um, check the flight times if we call somebody up and They've gotten so good that they actually emulate typing now as if they're typing what you said, um, but they're not. All the way to, you know, more experiential things um, that are fun. So if you have any of the assistants at home, you can play games with them. Um, and we've got clients and, that are looking at how do you build games and skills and things like that for those assistants. So I think it, it, it's a broad continuum, yep. um, but it's really that expression of artificial intelligence mixing utility and experience together. And, and then, Gary, in, in terms of AR, 
um, you know, AR and VR and 360 get mixed up. Um, help us understand what we mean when we're talking AR um, and how, if at all, AI and AR together potentially working. Yeah, I think the, the first thing is just to kind of differentiate between the, the three of them. Um, augmented reality, probably everybody in this room has been viewing for about 10 years. The easiest example is the yellow line on your screen when you're watching a football down football game that shows the first down. Yep. That's layering animation on top of content. Now, it's obviously advanced significantly since then that now it's much more immersive it's just animation that's laid on the world that you're living in that you can then interact with. Virtual reality is immersive um, video content where you feel like you are at that location. Very different than 360 video. 360 video is me sitting here and just panning left to right and up, to, up and down. VR is really giving you the sense and the emotion that you're there. And then there's another step to VR which is walking into a truly am animated world. If anybody's played any of the new VR games with Oculus or HDC or these complex headsets, you can see your hands. You are inside the video game really playing, and it's very, very immersive. Um, it's just a new narrative to storytelling, and it's really gonna continue to grow and evolve um, you know, as, as we move forward. Um, there's been significant investment in these mediums by big players, Facebook, Google, um, and more. And I think we're just on the cusp where it's gonna really start evolving. The headsets and device prices are gonna come down, the content's gonna get better, and it's gonna give consumers even more options uh, that are out there to just experience amazing things. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. My frame of reference for AI has, and I half-jokingly said iRobot, but that, that really had been my reference for some period of time. And then obviously as you start to use Siri and people start talking about Alexa and Google Home, I'm like, wow, I'm in this space. I better go get those things and learn about them. How many people have an Alexa I was just Google getting, that's, Thank you for doing that. That's like, where I was going. I'm always curious. So about half the room. How They're many people have Google Home? Very few. I mean, okay. they're fifty dollars. Go order one. We all do well enough to be here. <coughs> Just go order one. Have it at your home. What, whichever one you want, it doesn't matter. But you got. That's the first way we all get into this stuff. Is just go buy one. Nothing's stopping any of you of doing that. That that to me is the most important thing. If we're in a room of marketers and brand leaders, yeah. like, and half the room has it, it's hard for us to continue to do what we do without general adoption. Full disclosure, I'm not an Amazon stockholder, but I highly recommend Alexa over Google Home today. Um, I think Google Home has the potential to be a much better product over time, but today the skills that have been built in to Alexa, they're far more advanced than Google Home is. So if you're going to go out and buy one, do your research, but I, I'm an Alexa fan. So, but with that, you know, you raise a great point, Doug. We're, we're in a room full of, of marketers. Um, what is the opportunity for marketing with regards to AI today? You, you, why don't you go for it, share whomever. The, the things you're doing. We're doing some um, interesting things actually with an, an OMG client, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, where we are allowing people to speak to the ad via the microphone enablement on their mobile device and ask it questions about how to use uh, one, of their, one of their medications, Theraflu. And it's interesting because when they speak into the ad itself, which is a new behavior that has to be trained, um, they can speak as a human being would. Is this safe for my son? Now, how does it know I'm not talking about the sun in the sky? It, it knows. It's built on uh, a knowledge domain for Watson Health that automatically starts to guide the process that then begins to learn from a corpus of knowledge that we're pulling in from GSK, and then reason against the way I've voiced the question to deliver back to me an answer that says, for children 12 and under, here are the recommended dosages. Or, okay. or call, there are guardrails in it because it's pharma, you know, or call, call a physician. Um, and so it's giving us some really interesting insights that we can deliver back to the advertiser to talk about the customer journey when you think about 
the implications on CRM, it becomes very, very interesting. What kinds of questions are people legitimately asking about how to use your drug? Um, it could reveal alternate use cases that could be uh, taken back. We're doing um, a couple of food ones with some food advertisers, and you start to think about the kinds of conversations that we will have not only with their media people and their brand managers, but then also test kitchens. Yeah. Like how do you start to now reveal what is the next hot ingredient? You know, it was all kale a couple of years ago. Well, what is it now? And is there such a thing as a national taste bud or is it really going to get a lot more intense around regional taste buds? So maybe in you know the Southwest, they're searching on a particular ingredient that the test kitchen should start innovating yeah. against. And we believe that this will create a very interesting consumer journey where the ad is nothing more than a container for continually learning new insights and updating creative to map to and learn against the way consumers are interacting with the ad itself so that you're constantly sending out the right the right message. So, you know, go ahead, Dr. I was just gonna say, I think what's interesting is that's one way to take and, and use an ad space, a container. I think what an Alexa does, and as we build skills for Alexa, we're able to take it outside of that container and make it more just human. So the ad and the brand experience becomes less like a branded impression that we buy, and it's creating this capability or service for the brand itself so that we're able to, you know, get out of these rectangles and boxes and banners and buttons that exist all over the place. So that actually helps very nicely set up the question I was going to ask which is, you know, we're in a room, we've been spending a good part of the day talking about programmatic and audience-based buying and, and media. Um, and there are many brands and agencies that haven't even figured that out yet. Are we at a place really where, where brands and agencies are equipped to, to really take advantage of AI and bots in a meaningful way? Um, are the skills at the agency or the brand there? And, and if not, what do we need to do to get there? Fundamentally, I think every agency needs to be thinking about tomorrow today yep. in some capacity. Whether, you know, I think that depends on the clients that you represent and the scale that you're able to, to build that around. Um, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough to have some amazing clients, some of them that are actually in this space, um, others that are commanding us to do these type of things. Um, so we're, we're able to bring tomorrow today. Um, for a Gatorade, for a Mountain Dew, um, for Apple, for Disney, whomever it might be. Um, that allows us then to build skills and competencies around how do we figure out what are the best use cases for um, you know, these areas around be it mobile or social or what have you so that then we can, we can start to figure out how to, how to mainstream them. Um, I think a lot of what we're trying to do is get a baseline understanding. What, what I talk to clients about is it's always important in today's data-driven world to aim constantly, but it seems like we've gotten to this place where we're ready, aim, 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 and maybe we'll fire, maybe we won't. And I think every now and then with these things, whether it's AI bots, AR, it doesn't matter. It gives you that opportunity to ready, fire, aim, which we need to do more of at times. You know, I think, I mean, we're building we're building smarter systems. So in some respects, advertising as we know it or marketing as we know it won't really look or feel anything like it does right now. I think that's the hardest thing for people to adapt to. And Richard Thaler, who's a behavioral economist, talks about this all the time. I'll say to people, you know, hey, who has a mobile phone? Everyone will say that. And it's like, yeah, but you know, in five years that could dra that could drastically work different. But we're not able to we're not able to grasp that because if we think of our DNA. We, we're sort of reactive to things. I think that's just the way that we, uh, uh, you know, sort of behave in, in some respects. But advertising, in, in, in a lot of ways, because of voice prompts, is going to change. So if you think about a search engine, you type keywords in. One of the things I talk to a lot of people about now is, you know, how do people talk in latent language? So yeah. slang. Yeah. You know, where's the best pizza in Manhattan? Is your new is your new prompt compared to typing in a number of keywords, and that's going to actually change what the advertising might even look like because you're not going to get something that, that shows on a visual screen. You're going to want something that actually talks back to you. 
And that goes back into, again, the three areas of AI and applied AI. The reason you say Alexa or Google or Cortana is because it's like the old computing of colon slash slash start. It's a prompt. It is yep. trying to learn from you so it gets a better idea of what you like and what you don't like. I think one of the things that's most frustrating with me is when I say Alexa, and I'll admit I've, I've had one for a long time, um, Alexa, play my favorite song. It doesn't know. It doesn't know what my favorite song is, even though I've asked you know, it to play Porter Robinson 80 times. Yeah. It doesn't know. Yeah. So that actually shows we're not in the smart systems that we think we should be in right no, we're now. In our and and th I think the things that we want to get to, you know, we're not there. So I think we're all in the level playing field of, mm -hmm. of, you know, just again experimenting with where these things can go because we don't know what that new marketing or that new advertising may uh, look like as a result of these systems. Gary, in terms of in terms of AR, you guys have done some interesting stuff in the sports realm. I mean, coming off of the Super Bowl. Um, what, what are brands or, or teams doing, for that matter, that's been interesting in AR? And more importantly, have we gotten to a point yet where we're connecting AI and AR, where you're learning about what people like to interact with and, and that's influencing what they're seeing? <laughs> um, I think a lot of uh, NFL's been a, a good leader in that. Um, there were a lot of campaigns uh, that we worked on this past uh, season with the Denver Broncos. And um, it was really about taking their fan community and engaging them with brands in a very unique and authentic manner. Uh, one of the examples was um, their Bud Light team can. The people with the fan community app every two weeks could scan the can and an augmented reality highlight brought to you by the NFL would come up, play something immersive, and there would be special offers or incentives uh, that they could then engage with. Um, something similar was leveraging their fan base with Coke off the stadium cups that you would buy at the concession stand, scanning them, and every like two games they would have a different cup, one for cancer awareness. So as people in the cause that they were bringing a compelling story and compassion to, whether it was military, so they did that kind of throughout the season. But I think that that's really just the beginning. They're really moving it into and now just transferring onto the virtual reality side, they're building experience, experiences where rookie quarterbacks can put on a headset and now they're observing what it's like to be at the line where somebody can point out the different players and look at the schemes from a training uh, mechanism as well. Yep. So I think that you're gonna see it from an experiential standpoint for fans and their brands. You're also gonna see the VR in training and really bringing them into situations that they wouldn't else uh, be able to be in until uh, game time. Uh, the next question you asked was how does it maybe integrate with bots or artificial intelligence? I think that we just, on the augmented reality side, we need more data points. I think when there's more data points of actual usable data where AR has already been out there in the world and it can correlate and talk with you know APIs like Watson's, uh, which has incredible data points, that's when you're gonna see the correlation and then you can build automation around some of those things. Yeah, I mean, it's just because I have a team can doesn't mean I'm a fan of that team necessarily. <laughs> Someone could have just given me that beer. And for that matter, just because I'm at the stadium watching the Broncos doesn't mean I'm a Broncos fan. So when you can start to tie some, some AI or, or artificial intelligence learning into that, to say, okay, we actually know who your favorite team is, and although you're holding a Jets can, you're actually, you know, a, a Chargers fan, right? Um, there, there's a way to connect the two, and and the experience ideally would change in that case, right? Yeah, I think definitely, and that's when you just stay with the personalized. Uh, one of the panels earlier was talking all about cookies, and it's really just creating a unique identity between the device or the consumer and being able to target them in a native, authentic, and really personalized manner. Yeah, okay. Hey, we th This session time flew past very, very quickly, but I, this is an important question, and I want to dig into it. If we go over here a little bit, we'll go over it, um, and hopefully these guys can stick around for some other questions afterwards. Um, but today, nearly all form factors or, or media platforms target audiences. Um, with the advent of AI and bots, um, 
do marketers near, need to now start to think about targeting robots? And what does that really mean? Absolutely, I think that's one of the key conclusions we walked away from um, CES with across you know, all of our um, activities there is we spend all of our time and energy marketing people. Um, but with the rise of robots, we now have to spend some time thinking about how do we market to robots or at least preference engines because all of us are going and making decisions at an Amazon or at a Google today that could affect how a robot five years from now might interact. We might make a choice around a product purchase that we might want a certain P&G product over some other product and therefore that's stored and when I ask Alexa to go order me detergent three years from now, it's just gonna pick that as the de facto. So I think as advertisers, we need to think about what is the role of these middle men or middle women or middle things um, and how do we have to break through them as much as the end consumer ultimately to change preferences already established. Uh, Jeff, do you, I or think, you been, I think yeah. if you have ever gained, who's ever gamed an algorithm here in their life? I won't tell on your boss. Yeah, if you've ever gamed an algorithm, you've, you've gamed a machine. So I think that's, uh, so we're just moving into a world that's it's gonna be almost like on steroids uh, to try to game you know, some of these algorithms to see how you break through. Um, because whenever you put rules or limitations, again, as humans, we try to break those rules and limitations. So. That's what great marketing is, is breaking through, like yeah. trying to break conventions. I mean, That's right. ha half of the success of a Super Bowl is not just buying the ad, but what you do, what you do with be, it. be around it. And, and actually, those who don't even buy an ad, but actually have tremendous success because they did it. So I, I, I think all of this is moving us to a hacker's mentality to some extent. How do you hack your media plans to think about this um, as much as anything. Yeah, I mean, I think we saw it even just this past year, and you know, five to one bots in the election in terms of you know how, who, that strategy there. I don't, I don't think that's been written a lot about, but I wish more people actually looked at it to see how that bot strategy was used, how people sort of gamed algorithms. And that's that's a great point that I'll I'll close with, which is we actually closed the day today with um, Cambridge Analytica talking about how they've used um, AI and data and targeting um, more broadly to help achieve the outcome that they did uh, with this year's election. Um, the session certainly won't get political, but it, it does raise some of those points with regards to how we can use some of these new technologies. And thank you all very much for joining us.